the greatest thing was if you get this done and do it well, then other women will be able to do it in the future too. You have made observations about me and we have only met a week or two ago that I have never thought about about myself. My patch as an astronaut, uh, my patch said, knowledge is the gateway. How would you describe humans to an alien that arrived to Earth for the first time? <laughs> What is the biggest challenge of landing a Hornet on an aircraft? <laughs> yeah, the biggest challenge is For... being invited to do such a thing. <laughs> well, sure. I was asked that question in astronaut training. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, and, how would I know? <laughs> uh, first woman on the Supreme Court of the United States, Sandra O'Connor, had the extreme privilege of working for President Reagan. But it is, you're a leader to get something done. So also keeping the mission in mind. And so My father used to buy horseshoes and horseshoe nails from Jimmy Stewart's father. There's a brevity to what time you have. One of the things I appreciate about His Holiness is, and I was honored to play a role in the establishment of the Space Force. I'm Barbara Barrett, and I'm privileged to be here with you today. Thank, Thank you. you. I guess for me in my life, the why would be um, because you you never know how long you have, and so uh, so take advantage of every day and do the best you can each day. And so the why is there's a brevity to what time you have and to make use of it wisely. If I said, why not a doctor? What would you tell me? Uh, you have done more homework than <laughs> but you expected. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that there was a time when it was thought that women couldn't do a lot of things. And today, uh, I think a lot of doors have been opened. A lot of opportunity is available to women that wasn't before, opportunity that was not before. Uh, and I happen to have the privilege of being on some of the first wave of a lot of that opportunity, and that made it important to do the best I could in order to uh, pave the way for others, to prove that women are capable, that women can do these things. And you know, Barbara, we've been traveling together a few days, and I like to observe things. There's two attributes that I have observed from you, and I want to know if I am right. The first one, I think, you have like a laser focus in what you do. I have an impression that when you start something, you just go for it until it's accomplished. And the second thing, you seem like a person that is always looking forward, like you don't plan in the short term, but it's always a vision of what is coming in the future. And I think you always were that way. Is that correct? I'll tell you what's very interesting is that you have made observations about me, and we have only met a week or two ago, that I have never thought about about myself. So I've never given that any consideration. I just, I do what I, I do what I do, and I don't know how it would be observed what I do. But I, I am conscious that, um, that, I'm conscious of time, and I'm conscious of the reality that time is short. Uh, and I, I would like to think that I am strategic about uh, important things, but I'm also playful about uh, uh, about non-important things. I hope to make that distinction. What was your biggest failure that became your greatest lesson or success? What would that be? Professionally, it would be uh, noted that I ran for governor of our state unsuccessfully, and so not to, to put yourself in the public eye and to go through a big political campaign uh, and not to be successful at it was, uh, was not my proudest moment. On the other hand, uh, the guy I ran against shortly thereafter got indicted and convicted. And, uh, and, and I think that in the end, people, many people, including both newspapers, in our state came up to me and said that they really made a mistake in their in their decision but the biggest attribute that came from that was that the people i worked with the people who
who joined the campaign, people I had never met before in most cases, uh, have become now, this is, this is almost 30 years later, and many of those people remain good friends. They have enriched my life by their presence. Um, so I have developed friendships that, from that that I never would have dreamed possible. And I do believe that, though I wouldn't have thought of it that way, that the, that, that failure uh, ended up being one of the reasons that I've been asked to do uh, other projects that have been life enriching. Uh, what has been the biggest lesson in your career and as a human? So professionally and personally, what are the two things that you would highlight? Professionally, maybe it's personal too. I had the great privilege of working with a woman uh, who was the first woman in the country to be the majority leader of any state, house, or senate. She went on to be more well known as a jurist, first woman on the Supreme Court of the United States, Sandra O'Connor. And watching her in action and watching her as she led meetings and, and developed public policy to help people, to make lives better for people. How much impact you can have if you work in public policy to, to make uh, people have greater opportunity and incentivize good behavior. Uh, but what I learned from her is you can do it all. You can uh, get out and women can really make a difference. But I also learned that it's important to work with people in a way that they, that, that working with you is enjoyable. Uh, that it, you get something done, but you do it in a fashion that is an enjoyable experience. And that maybe was one of the greatest professional lessons. And I think it also is an important personal lesson. What attribute makes a good leader? Communication skills have to be high priority. Integrity is, is integral to everything. If you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. But with if you assume in, uh, integrity, then communication skills uh, some empathy, understanding what your, the, if you're the leader, mm -hmm. understanding what the followers, uh, what the what the people around you are facing and doing, and and uh, what their what their uh, what impacts their lives is important. But it is you're a leader to get something done. So also keeping the mission in mind and figuring out alternate ways, being flexible to find new ways of achieving uh, goals. And you know, it, it is long said in military environments that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Uh, have a plan, but continue the opportunity. Uh, take advantage of opportunities that come up. Be opportunistic when uh, when occasions arise. So I'm going to give you random words or names, okay. and you need to tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Dalai Lama. Oh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I so appreciated the Dalai Lama. One of the things I appreciate about His Holiness is, of course, he's referential and he is a very solemn and careful man and a great leader in, in so many ways, both temporal and in all ways. But he also has a great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And he often gets his jokes before he tells them. And so he starts giggling before he's even talked what, what, what it is that he finds humorous. And then people have to hear what it is in order to catch up to the humor that he's, that he's feeling. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama is a, is a great leader. You wonder how a child selected at such a young age could have so much wisdom. But he, he does carry it off and, and the world is better for it. In Christmas trees. <laughs> Well, I come from a community that really, oh, I didn't know Indiana that Indiana County, Pennsylvania. That at the time when I was growing up, perceived themselves or had the tagline, "The Christmas tree, capital of the world." And at Christmas, we had a farm, and on the farm in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Game Commission, in order to provide undercover for wild animals to hide in, gave farmers seedlings to plant in order to have uh, cover for for animals. And we accepted hundreds of these seedlings. My dad rigged up a plow to go on the back of the tractor and put a seat on the plow so that my brother could sit on the plow and drop a seedling in 
as the, as the earth was turned, and my job was to come along behind and to tamp down the earth around the, the roots of the seedling. And so we, we became uh, Christmas tree growers, and in, I was probably five or six years old when we were when we were planting those seedlings. And now we go horseback riding under the boughs of of, the, of those great Christmas trees. Kilimanjaro. You know, I uh, I'm often inclined to set goals to to decide on something that's aggressive. Each year, my husband and I attempt to do at least one. Uh, exertive vacation. And so we've bicycled across the state of Arizona. I bicycled across Finland. Uh, one year, our goal was to climb Kilimanjaro. So in 2007, we climbed Kilimanjaro. It was a great experience. And uh, summiting Kilimanjaro with my husband, my brother, and my wonderful sister in law was really an, a, a great uh, experience. If I say education, you what? know, I, education is the key to. To success in so many ways, it was certainly the key to my opportunities. Uh, so my patch as an astronaut, uh, my patch said, "Knowledge is the gateway. You, we, the, the doorway to opportunity is through uh, education and, for, and through getting a better understanding and finding knowledge and wisdom." Hopefully. It's a space force. Uh, to defend the United States, uh, we today's. Uh, environment, we depend upon space in almost everything we do. And so it is uh, timely that we now have a new military service, the first new military service in 75 years. And there have only been two military services since George Washington was president that, that have, were created since Washington was president. One was the Air Force and the other is the Space Force. And I was honored to play a role in the establishment of the Space Force. Say Ronald Reagan. Oh, I had the extreme privilege of working for President Reagan. And um, I, I really admired this was a leader of great strength. Uh, he had simple, uh, direct, uh, under, uh, understandable uh, mission that he wanted to, to achieve. And being a part of his team was a privilege. Say Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, so. We grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm, and when we would go to town, we would go to Blairsville or Indiana, Pennsylvania, and that was the home of Jimmy Stewart. So my father used to buy horseshoes and horseshoe nails from Jimmy Stewart's father. Jimmy Stewart's father had, had the hardware store, the, owned the little hardware store in Indiana County, Pennsylvania. Famously, when Jimmy Stewart won his first Oscar, that little statue he took back and gave to his dad, and his dad put it at the front window of that hardware store on Philadelphia Street in, in Indiana, Pennsylvania. So we would walk in past that little statuette, and I remember going in with my dad one time, holding his hand, and my hand was over my head, so I must have been pretty small. And he walked up to the, the hearth. There was a fat pot-bellied stove in the middle of this long, skinny hardware store, and old Mr. Stewart was sitting there on one of about four or five mismatched chairs. The rocking chair was Mr. Stewart's. My dad asked Mr. Stewart, how's Jimmy doing? And my ears perked up because Jimmy was a kid's name, and I thought, well, there must be a kid around here. Um, and it turned out that uh, Mr. Stewart responded that, oh, he's doing great. He just got a new contract. And the contract sounded like an old person thing, so I was confused. So I tugged on my dad's hand and said, hey, dad, who's Jimmy? So my dad explained to me that Jimmy Stewart was an actor and that if uh, once he got uh, the hardware that he needed, he'd take, a, he'd take me by and show me where Jimmy Stewart had lived. So Jimmy Stewart was a great um, actor and maybe I identify with him. He's sort of like everybody's brother or, or next door neighbor, um, but he also had a hand in establishing Thunderbird. Uh, he built the runway as a pilot, World War II era pilot, famously having fought in World War II and a bomber, uh, having flown a bomber in World War II, he also built the runway that became the airfield that was Thunderbird, that became the graduate school that I had the privilege of being associated with. And what is the biggest challenge of landing a Hornet on an <laughs> aircraft? 
yeah, the biggest challenge is for, being invited to do such a thing. Well, I'm sure that will be the first one. <laughs> yeah. But when you cross that line, yeah. what, what challenges are they involved in? I had great comfort from knowing that I was with an, a superb instructor pilot uh, who who was there at my side at all at all times. But it was a great privilege and a great excitement. And in my case, women weren't allowed to do that uh, routinely. So in my case, uh, it was the challenge of knowing that if I don't do this well, it will reinforce the idea that women can't do it. If I do it well, I have the opportunity of opening the door for other women to be able to do it. But that also means that we put them at risk and we put those women, uh, but they are, they, but it, it allows them the opportunity to put themselves at risk and, and have the career uh, line open to them. So the challenges were, were significant in the physical, there's a physical challenge, there's a mental challenge, there's a lot to it. But the greatest thing was if you get this done and do it well, then other women will be able to do it in the future too. Great answer. And how do you handle stress? The you know, omnipresent I don't... stress in our society, how do you cope with it? It's such a popular word these days, but for me, I, oh, I should say never pressure. Been, yeah, it's a better I, word, or no? I've often ridiculed pressure and stress. I think people can talk themselves into it or out of it, and I think that, from my perspective, you just get the job done. Um, and I exercise. I try to. I love nature. I get out in the outdoors. My husband and I met at the top of a mountain, uh, so nature is a big part of my life. Um, and I don't get stressed out about things. I do my best to do a good job. I take on pretty challenging undertakings, but I, I don't inflict stress on myself. Mm. And so I, I, don't, I don't worry about it. And I meant to ask you before, uh, what is the biggest lesson you learn uh, in the astronaut training program? Just how grand the Earth is and how important it is to keep stretching, keep trying to do new things, keep learning new things. And I went through that program when I was uh, 60 years old. And a, a lot of people my age were retiring and I was, I was testing myself to, uh, to become an astronaut or to qualify to go to space. So I learned that, uh, that even in, in the more uh, retired age, you can still be taking on new challenges and, and, uh, and not be counted out of it. And I was able to succeed at qualifying to go to space. Can you name uh, three people that changed the course of your life? <laughs> oh, that's funny that you would ask. Have you, is this further from the background research that you've done? Should I tell you a story? Well, I'm going to tell you a different story. Okay. And then we can come back to the three sure. people if you like. But I was asked that question in astronaut training. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, and, how would I know? <laughs> uh, and a part of astronaut training is the obligation to go see a shrink, to go see a psychiatrist or psychologist or whatever that, was, whatever that is. And I had not spent any time with that, quali with that uh, qualified person. And there were a number of tests that he gave us. But one of them was just take out a sheet of paper and write down the, ten, the names of the 10 people who've been most influential on your life. And so I thought, okay, I took it seriously. I took the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then sixth. Then I was getting a little further out and thinking a little bit harder about it. Then sixth and seventh. And I thought, well, this guy doesn't know me, and he doesn't know anybody I know. Seven, eight, nine, ten. I just filled out names. And I handed it in, and he said it was wrong. I said, well, how could he possibly know that my answers are wrong? I could have put down Donald Duck and you know, I could, he wouldn't know. And he handed me back the piece of paper and he said, I was wrong because I hadn't missed it myself. And I never conceived that one of the most influential people in my life was going to be myself. And so that just changed the whole approach. But I think he made a good point that really... Uh, the decisions that you make are going to be significantly influential on your life. So, um, so I there certainly I answered. I gave thought to who the three people most influential in my life were, but I also was. He taught me the lesson 
that one of the most influential people in your life is yourself. Don't don't be thinking outside forces are going to be the way you decide uh, your life's direction. But my uh, three people in my life would have been my dad, uh, probably Sandra Day O'Connor, um, and uh, and a, a guy that ran the bookstore that I worked for, who I would have never thought was going to be influential in my life, but he ended up being the guy that. Every time I was going through an FBI background check, they went and talked to him and uh, because he was a, a findable. My dad, a family member, Sandra O'Connor, a public leader and someone that I worked with in that regard, and Bob Little, just a bookstore owner who I worked for, who, uh, who saw me in action and reported to the FBI uh, favorable things. Sometimes people you don't expect, right? Completely. That's why I started unexpected. that children book project because I realized every seed you plant has an impact. Yeah. It gives and a tree never... that you may not see, but it may change the world. Yeah. Uh, most improbable yeah. and some of the most improbable sources are what some of the most impactful yeah. uh, results come from. How would you describe humans to an alien that arrived to Earth for the first time? <laughs> Well, I, yeah, that, yeah, I, <laughs> I told you my questions sometimes are yeah. unusual, yeah, oh, geez. but I they're this, thoughtful. Yeah, yeah. So how would you describe the humankind? Uh, I think we are um, social beings uh, that interact uh, usually well and occasionally poorly. Beings that seek uh, comfort and adventure. And how would you describe travel? To someone that has never been on a trip. Travel is probably the best way to get an education. An open-minded, if you travel with an open mind, you'll learn more through travel than you will through any other source. It's a combination of travel and reading, or travel and input, so, so either reading or audiovisual uh, sources. But travel plus text kind of learning really is uh, more more uh, educational than any other mm -hmm. thing I can think of. What is the most common mistake you see happening over and over on people's careers? I think that sometimes people become too confident or think they've done it all and there's and plateau. They plateau when there's really much more that they can do. And maybe the biggest mistake is plateauing on the basis of what they've done rather than on the basis uh, rather than thinking about what they could do with the portfolio they've built what what can they do to help others what can they do to uh, educate inspire uh, affect influence others to uh, to make society better to make their lives better what do you learn from your father uh, everything uh, probably the best was no artificial barriers. Um, look, at, look for opportunity, and don't confine yourself artificially. Mm -hmm. And from your mom, from your mother, um, stick to itiveness. Um, get over the get over the challenges and figure out how to get it done. And can you share an anecdote with someone we all know well? Thinking about Sandra Day O'Connor, first well known as the first woman on the United States Supreme Court, that I was driving her one time, as we were going to our ranch, and she knows ranches well, having been raised on a ranch herself. But as we were coming through the little town, the county seat, where our ranch is located, it was at the time of the of the county fair, and so I said, Sandra, do you want to? Would you like to go take a look at the county fair? Oh, she said she'd love to. So we went, and as we walked through the barns of the county fair, and there were the 4-H projects, and the ducks, and the goats, and the chickens, and the sheep, and the cattle, and, I, and ever the judge, she would, Justice O'Connor, would, would point out you know, that one with the blue ribbon. Well, that one's back isn't quite as straight as the one. That one with the red ribbon should have been the one to take. So it was a, um, a characteristic of the judge. She was able to evaluate 
things, uh, whether they were in the portfolio or not, of that uh, case that would be coming before the Supreme Court, ever the judge. Please, can you tell me about her? Like When I would tell her something or when we talk about something, she was very approving, very affirming. Uh, and one of the things that she would say would be, good, 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 good. And so and, you know, a lot of people would say, good? Uh, good, good was just the, uh, the usual comment that she would make when she's, when she's uh, complimentary or something. So you would always look to, hope to earn a good, good from Sandra O'Connor. You have met many presidents, right? Is there any characteristic that they will all share? Almost without exception, there's a sobriety about it. There is a, a, a knowledge of the gravity of the role. And I, I think even, the, even when putting on the appearance of nonchalance or of ease, there's a gravity in the Oval Office uh, because of the of the importance of that job and the global impact of that job, that in any any president of the United States or the presidents and former prime ministers and presidents that I've worked with around the world, I think that there is a gravity that they understand about the impact to their to the impact on the lives of people in their in their constituency or in the world. What would you do different if you had to start all over again? Probably I would have, uh, it's, uh, it's all worked out. I haven't any complaints, but I probably would have um, studied harder um, and then maybe chosen uh, more rigorous. I was a math major, but I might have continued to learn uh, math and rigorous uh, academic pursuits. What would Barbara of today Tell Barbara in her twenties. Um, um, do in your twenties is that time of building and growing, building, learning. Uh, so in my twenties, I was working a lot, but I uh, I think that the important thing for it for me in my twenties would have been to to continue the work, but also experience all kinds of, of skills, build skills, uh, learn how to learn to speak Spanish better, learn to be a better photographer, learn to um, you know, scuba dive, learn to get credentialed in more things, and, and then select among those. And get those in the portfolio so that for the rest of your life, you can figure out which of those are the things that you want to have be permanent parts of your life. If you had to recommend three books that anybody should read, what would they be? Well, I'm a little biased toward um, historic. So, uh, Endurance by Lansing uh, about Shackleton's uh, starting as an adventure but ending as a great uh, Leader. leadership story. Uh, Undaunted Courage by Stephen Ambrose about the Lewis and Clark expedition across the United States and exploring the Louisiana Purchase and finding a way to the West. And I would add to that the Hero of the Empire about Winston Churchill and the Boer War and his, and his work in, in South Africa. What is your favorite quote? I don't know that it's a quote, but there's sort of a maxim that I try to live by, and that's work hard, play hard. Uh, I, I I don't know if I'm quoting somebody or if that is just a max about I don't know where that originated, mm -hmm. but work hard, play hard is sort of uh, a, a mantra. Business advice for young people. Or go do, go into business. There's nothing as good for business as being in business. And so opening a lemonade stand for a young person up through um, taking on, starting some new brand venture like Elon Musk would do. Um, go take, find something that people want and that, or that uh, makes the life, makes the world better and, and do it with a business strategy and, and that's sustainable so that it will be around for a while. You know, I have this project that I call Dreams for the World and I ask everybody, what is your dream? So here we go. What is your dream? Uh, 
So there's lots of dreams on my part from my personal dream is, uh, is a sustainable one. But my dream in the big picture is to just have the have the people of the world live better lives, to have good health, uh, opportunity and education, uh, eliminate tragic wars like we've, we've seen even much too close to home and much too recently, uh, but to, to have life on earth be better and to continue to grow and learn and explore. The things we're learning through the telescope, uh, with the James Webb Telescope and the Magellan Telescopes and soon to be, we hope, the giant Magellan Telescope. We learn things about the outer cosmos. And at the same time right now, we are learning things about subatomic particles, learning at CERN and in other settings to uh, how the, the most minute of particles mm -hmm. uh, function and, and, and the elements, uh, the part of the pieces that go into that. So we're, we're learning new things right now. And uh, I think that's one of the most exciting parts mm -hmm. of life. My last question. I always finish all my videos, all my whatever I do, even my letters and my emails with never stop dreaming. That's uh -huh. kind of my closing message. Uh, and I ask everybody to make an interpretation of those worlds from your point of view, like based on your experience, your life, your emotions, your feeling. What would you say the world about never stop dreaming? How will you make an interpretation yeah. of that? It, it is, I think, a truth that if you dream it, uh, you can do it. And some the dreams are the source of so much of our progress. So keep dreaming. Uh, never stop dreaming is a great mantra. And uh, I think that it allows people to, ex to extend their mind to ways of thinking that they wouldn't, that are not reality today. And that's where great progress derives. So I, I agree with it. Never stop dreaming.